Father, we worship you, God. We thank you. God, that you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God, not only did you create us, but you love us and you watch over us, Father. We thank you for the great love that you have for us and that you would send your son Jesus to come and lay down his life for us, God. God, I pray that uh, that, that reality would continue to, uh, to penetrate our hearts and minds, God, that it would shape the way that we live, Father, the way that we uh, live in response to who you are, to what you've done in our lives, God. Father, I pray that, that tonight as we continue to worship you, God, as we continue to, uh, to fellowship with one another, Father, I pray that, that our hearts would be open uh, to your word, uh, God, open to your spirit moving in our hearts, God. And uh, we just thank you, God. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to be able to worship together tonight. Uh, before you're seated, would you take a moment to greet those around you? Let them know you're glad they're here. Then you can have a seat. Uh, good evening, Ben. Yeah. Good evening, Pastor hey. Ryan. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Pastor Ben. Hey, uh, right. good to see you guys. Ton of uh, information going on and ton of information going on. A lot of on. stuff. These are going to be really good. A lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. And so if, you're, if you have plans at all this fall... Uh, just cancel them. That's all I'm going to say because there's really important can, yeah. information coming yeah, up. Yeah, we have a whole agenda for you. So get your calendar yep. out and get ready to write. If you want to follow along with any of these, we have, uh, you can follow along on the digital bulletin on our website and you can get there by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you. Uh, so, yeah, cool. pretty handy, huh? So next week, Wednesday night. Next and, week. Uh, yeah, next week, it's Wednesday gonna night. It's going to be huge. And next Sunday night are our vision nights where we are entering into the midpoint of our first discipleship initiative. And I've said it for a few weeks now. I'm just going to tell you there's really important new information. That's all I can say. But you don't know what we're going to talk about. So don't think you already know it. Um, don't, don't think you're prepared for it. This is something that if you're in, in this, if this is your church, you want to be at those events. So there's some important details about that. I'm curious to see what's going to happen. Yes, you should be. Uh, uh, so, yeah, looking forward to you that. You know, though. Hearing what's, <laughs> what's next. But, yeah, so that's Wednesday night, uh, September 5th or 4th mm -hmm. uh, at 7 p.m. And, uh, and then Sunday night, uh, September 8th at uh, 7 p 5 p.m. Uh, my my brain is not working yep. at the yep. moment. And, uh, and we will have child care available on Sunday night. So if that's something that you need to take advantage of, uh, be sure to keep that in mind. Those services are, it's two identical services. So you don't need to come to both unless you just, again, want to fill your calendar yes. with emergent stuff, yes. which we welcome. Yep. But it is the same service. So uh, just two options of when to come. It's that important that we wanted to do it and twice to give everyone two options of, of different time frames. So hopefully one of those will work for you. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's going to be an exciting night. Something else that's coming up is, uh, well, one of the things that, that we're wrestling through right now, and, and we're going to talk more about this at Vision Night, is just the tension that we're living in as far as running out of space in different areas and different uh, in kids ministry and in, in our auditoriums and stuff. It's why we created Thursday night service. Yes. Service um, did not exist a year ago. Yeah. So, so it's been uh, almost coming up on a year mm -hmm. uh, that we've done uh, Thursday night service. But, uh, but one of the tensions that we're, that we're feeling right now is in kids ministry. And so to alleviate some of that, we're actually going to be uh, adding our third grade into 45th street, which is our fourth and fifth grade ministry. That happens on Sunday mornings. So uh, Sunday mornings, all services, it will be 3rd and 45th Street. That starts September the 8th, uh, same day as Vision Night. Yeah, so September 8th, Move Up Sunday. And what's important to know about that, if, you're in, if your student's going into 3rd or 4th grade, you've never done this before, you probably always brought them over to E-Town over here, uh, our 45th Street meets two doors, doors down in Suite 500. And so that's where that is, and you can just make that change September 8th. It's going to be... 
It's going to be awesome. Yep. Coming up right after that, we have a, a number of different ministries that are launching. It's that season, right? As school starts back and everything, uh, student ministry Wednesday nights launches back September the 18th. Uh, that's every week at 6:30, grades 6 through 12th. And uh, so, if you are a student or have a student or know a student in that age range, uh, it's a great opportunity to come and uh, and worship with. Uh, people the same age and hear the gospel uh, and and play some games and and hang out and, and build some Christian community. So don't miss out on that and, uh, and be sure to tell uh, everyone you know. Yeah, God's doing a really cool work at our student ministry. It's, it's about doubled in the last two years and it's really cool. Um, students are coming to faith in Christ. Students are growing in discipleship. They're going out on mission trips. Uh, it's just a really sweet season of what God's doing in the student ministry. And so if you have a student and they've never tried it, uh, I, th- I think they'd love it if, if they check it out on, in September. Yep. And then, uh, then coming up right after that, we have uh, September the 22nd, which is Church Outside. We're going to talk more about that in a few, but also that week kicks off our community group season. And so uh, if you're not in a community group, you definitely want to join a community group. It's the lifeblood of our church. Uh, it's the way we're, we're uh, you know, a large church becomes small to be able to develop relationships and live in community to know one another and be known by one another. We can't do that in this place, uh, you know, on a Sunday morning or a Thursday night. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that you mentioned the one another's. It's impossible to do the one another's in Scripture without community, right? Like it's impossible to grow in the fruit of the Spirit without community. And one of the gifts God gives us to help us to become more like Christ is community. And, and what I know for sure is you will not uh, grow into the, the best version of Christ you can be through sanctification or, or growth, if, if you're new, and that's a big word, uh, unless you, you take a step into community. And so I uh, just want to su- strongly encourage you to take that step. Absolutely. Well, if you're a guest with us, we're really glad that you're here. Welcome to Emergence. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of what to expect every week as we gather, we worship in a number of different ways. We worship through uh, singing songs together as we just did, and we'll, we'll do some more later. Um, but we worship through opening God's Word, studying Scripture together, and we're walking through the book of John together right now. Uh, we worship through serving and on ministry teams called Impact Teams. We have information that we're, uh, you may have received a card. We have some of those cards at the, uh, the welcome desk as well, at the connect desk as well, if you want to grab one of those and, and sign up to serve in an area on one of the, the Impact Teams. It's one of the ways that that, that we worship. We also worship through generosity, through bringing our tithes and offerings uh, to the Lord as an act of worship, as an act of obedience and trust that, that we do uh, put our trust fully in God and not on the, the things of this world. Uh, but we don't pass a plate during service. We have boxes in the back. Uh, most of us give online. Uh, but if you're a guest, uh, you know, we're not asking you to give tonight. We're just glad that you're here. And uh, we would love for you to fill out a connect card. And you can find that also in the seat back in front of you. Uh, uh, where you can scan the, the QR code and fill that out on your phone, or you can use an ink pen and fill it out right there on the paper oh. and, uh, and bring that by the Connect Desk after service. And uh, either way, stop by the Connect Desk. Let them know that, that you're new here, and we have a small gift that we would love to give you. Uh, there's people there that, that have blue shirts on that can answer any questions you have about our church or the ministry that happens here. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, Church Outside, we're going to talk more about that, but uh, before we do, let's watch this video. Yeah, we should. And and maybe one more thing. Yes. If you are new here, and uh, one of the things we do as a church is an opportunity to connect called Discover Emergence. Mm. Usually, that meets the first Sunday of the month. However, with Which would be Sunday. Which would be Sunday. And it's a holiday. Yes. With the holiday, it's going to meet... Next week. Okay. So, so next if you're Sunday. New, exploring the church and want to check out Discover Emergence, it's it, rather than meeting the first Sunday of the month, this month is the only month it's going to meet on the second Sunday of the month. So, yep. And that happens during the second service, so 10 20 on Sunday. So, uh, if you would like to, to join us for that, uh, we would love for you to. All right. Cool. Let's watch Church Outside.
Well, hey, everybody, how are you? It is great to be with you tonight, and uh, always is. If you're visiting with us, really glad you're here. We are excited for Church Outside, September 22nd. Uh, it's going to be a great day. It also happens to be my birthday, by the way, on September 22nd, so I can't think of a better way to spend it with all of you, the whole church coming together that day. And that's exciting, but not as exciting as the chance that we have to come together to praise Jesus, but also to see, and we've been praying for this, that this would be... We've been praying that it would be the biggest day of a harvest of life our church has ever seen. And the way that that happens is by God prompting us and putting on our hearts to reach out to those that we love. You guys got this card on your seat as you came in. Take a look at it. It's beautiful. It's awesome. And our hope is that these cards would end up in the hands of people that God wants to know that they are beautifully made in his image and that they can respond to his gospel. And so I want to challenge you today to make a decision, okay? So it's not, not often that I'll kind of throw it out there like this, but I think, you know, it's one thing to get these cards and go, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite somebody. I'm going to think about inviting somebody. But as you think about who God has placed in your life and who God has placed you in their life, think about the person that you go, man, I know this person and they so desperately need Jesus. And all of us need Jesus, right? So, but that person that God puts in your mind, when you go, man, if this person could only know Christ, I want to challenge you to make a decision today that this week you're going to take this card and you're going to make it a point to get it in their hands. That it, it's one thing to say, I'm going to invite somebody, but make a decision, manufacture a deadline and say, by this time next week, this card is going to be in their hands because I love them and I want them to know Christ. And then pray for them. Pray that they would come out, invite them to join you at church outside. It's going to be an awesome day and a great chance to share the gospel and be praying for the event. We're, we're praying together. As a church, over the next several weeks, we started this past Tuesday, uh, joining together at 7 a.m. here and in Ringwood. And if you are free on Tuesdays at 7 a.m., come out and join us. But even if you can't join us, we hope you will. But even if you can't, make it a point on Tuesdays to pray together, dedicate some time to it, pray that God would move hearts, that there would be a huge harvest of life on that day, uh, that people would be brought to life through this event on the 22nd. Really good. It could be their birthday. It could be their spiritual birthday on September 22nd. And that's our hope. Uh, that it, that it would be for many. And, uh, you know, so make that decision together. We made a decision as a church like over a year and a half ago that we were going to walk through the book of John this year. And so we have been. We've been since March walking through the book of John together, step by step, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We made it to John 18. And we've taken the last seven weeks of our series and dedicated it to five chapters. And 13 through 17 are all about four to five hours of Jesus's life. It's like it's zoomed in to this one meeting between Jesus and his disciples. And he gathered with them. And you remember, he prepared them for what was to come. He, he ate a meal with them. He gave them the hope of heaven. Last week we saw that Ryan shared about how in John 17, he prays not just for the disciples, but he prayed for us. He prayed for the ones that would come as a result of the church being built and born and that we would be unified as we follow him on mission and reach the world with the gospel. We spent those weeks focused on just those you know, few hours of Jesus's life. But as we turn to John 18, it's gonna speed up really quickly. And we're about to see these, you know, really a chain reaction of events that happens in a very small amount of time. A lot of stuff going on that's gonna set off the arrest, the trial, the torture, the death, Jesus' sacrifice for us, the burial, and ultimately the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what we're going to dive in tonight. It's going to start moving very quickly. Let's jump right into John chapter 18, verse 1. It says this, when Jesus had spoken these words, so when he finished praying, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. So Jesus finishes his prayer. He says, hey, we're going to head out from here. Let's go up to where we've been gathering, where we've been staying, up on the Mount of Olives to this garden from the other passages. We know that this is the Garden of Gethsemane. And so they head that direction. And as they do, I want to just give you a little picture. I got a map here. I want to give you a little picture of, of all these events that are about to happen because it's going to happen very quickly. They started in the upper room there in the city. They're going to move east along the bottom side of the temple, go up the east side of the temple over the Kidron Valley and up to the Garden of Gethsemane. And they're going to cut back. We're going to go to Annas' house, Caiaphas' house, a trial. We're going to head before Pilate. And then ultimately, uh, we'll see Jesus head toward the cross. 
And this is all going to start to come together very quickly, but there's all these motions that happen in just these few chapters that we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. But it's interesting that it says that as he set out, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron. So along the east side of the temple there, there's the Kidron Valley. And Kidron means darkness. That's what the word means. This is the valley of darkness. But at the bottom of that valley, there's something called a wadi. It's this valley in the point where it gathers. And there was a stream that ran down that valley called the brook Kidron. And it's a really small detail that you can miss, but the brook Kidron actually is mentioned several times in scripture. The first time it's mentioned, we see David is fleeing from Absalom. And he's running for his life. Absalom's coming after him. He has all of his people. And it says that they, they head over the brook Kidron to go into the wilderness and hide so that he could be preserved. The second time we see it, we see it in the book of 2 Kings. And there's a moment where King Josiah, who is over Israel at that time, he orders all of the idols of Israel to be destroyed. He says to grind them into a fine powder. And he says, cast them into the brook Kidron. And they flowed down the brook Kidron. One of the most poignant moments of this little stream is in Ezekiel 11, where God issues a prophecy through Ezekiel, where he tells the people of Israel that because of their detestable leaders, that he is removing the glory of God from Jerusalem, that the glory of God is leaving their city. He says, my my presence, my glory is no longer going to be with you. And it departs to the east over to the Mount of Olives. And as, it, as they do that, it says that it leaves over the brook Kidron, but he prophesies in Isaiah 43 that one day my glory will return to Jerusalem. That one day my glory will come back in its fullness. And we see that in the book of John, we're told that Jesus is the glory of God. He is the glory of God in its fullness in the flesh. In fact, in in John chapter 12, he says, this is now the hour of my glory. The glory of God has returned to Jerusalem. He's going over the brook Kidron. And then one of the most wild things is, remember, this is during Passover week. So as Jesus is heading to the Garden of Gethsemane, it's during Passover week. What's happening during Passover week? All these people are bringing their sacrifices to the temple. And thousands and thousands of sacrifices are happening. And when those sacrifices are made, the workers in the temple then take all of the refuse from those sacrifices and they throw them into the brook Kidron. So there's a real reality that as Jesus is walking over this brook to the Garden of Gethsemane, that the blood of thousands and thousands of sacrifices, by the way, none of which have the power to take away sin, all of which were pointing to the true sacrifice, the one who would come, the true lamb of God, the perfect offering that the blood of all of those other sacrifices is flowing through this brook as Jesus, the true lamb, passes over it and makes his way to the garden of Gethsemane. They get to the garden and this is what happens. It says, now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So John begins to paint this incredible scene. Jesus goes to the garden with his disciples. Judas, one of the 12, the one who betrayed him, remember he was at the Last Supper and he said to Judas, go do what you have to do. He told his disciples that one was going to betray him. Judas leaves that meal and it says he goes and procures a a band. The actual word is a cohort. And scholars debate this number, but the reality is the number of, of soldiers with Judas as he goes up to the garden to arrest Jesus is somewhere between a couple hundred and a thousand soldiers. Jesus is, Judas is going up with oh, maybe a thousand soldiers, this giant army to go and arrest Jesus. And they're going with torches and they're going with weapons to arrest Jesus. And this scene is wild to me. It, everything about it just seems wrong. Here is Judas. Remember, Judas was with Jesus through his ministry. Judas saw how Jesus was doing miracle after miracle, how he had compassion on these people who had come to him for help, longing for life, longing for a savior. Judas saw it firsthand. And now Judas is leading maybe a thousand soldiers with weapons and torches up to arrest Jesus who loved Judas and loved these people. This whole scene seems like, not only is it wrong, but it seems like the enemy is winning at this point. There's this giant mob coming after Christ. Like this whole thing is spinning out of control. 
Have you guys ever been in situations like that in your own life where you just feel like everything is going wrong? <laughs> everything is, feels like it's out of control. I feel helpless. I feel powerless. This whole thing is too big for me. And it generates things in us, especially when it's something unjust, right? Like if you want to feel that feeling when, you have, when you're a parent and you have a kid and someone's mistreating your kid, you know the feeling you get? <laughs> of like, I feel like my, my own self could be out of control in those moments. We've all had those moments, right? Where our emotions start running. This scene, I can't imagine for the disciples what this was like, seeing this army come to, to take Jesus. Um, you know, I, I can remember a number of times in my life where I've felt that. And I know Ryan has shared a couple of times about when he was a teenager and got arrested. Um, but I have a confession. He is not the only pastor who's been arrested. <laughs> and there is one pastor on staff who actually was arrested as a pastor. And I'm not proud of it. <laughs> but this was one of those moments for me. So we were working at, at Jacksonville Chapel. And one day I was hungry, went out to get some lunch, drove down Jacksonville Road. There's a little place called Plains Pantry at the time in Pompton Plains. And I wanted to get a sandwich. I drive down Jacksonville Road to Newark Pompton Turnpike. And I make a left. And of course, I see a police car pull out behind me and I get, you know, my heart starts going a little bit. I'm watching in my rearview mirror. He seems to be following me. And then all of a sudden there goes the lights. And I had that, that feeling. I'm like, oh, what? Are, you know, I, don't, I wasn't speeding. What was I doing? And so I pull over the side of the road and you know, the guy comes over and he says, hey, I need your license and registration. I hand it to him and he goes, hey, I pulled you over because your registration's expired. And I was like, oh man, I'm sorry. I, you know, I just moved. I probably didn't get the notice in the mail and you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I said, well, listen, I'm gonna give you a ticket because uh, your registration is expired and you need to take care of it. So I went right from there. I went and renewed my registration, drove straight to DMV. It was in the days before you could do it online. So I drove straight, this is like 20 years ago. I drove straight to DMV, got my, my registration renewed and I took the ticket home and I went to pay it online immediately because I didn't want to forget. And I went online, typed it in, all, but it took like a day or two to get in the system for me to be able to pay it. And so it wasn't there. I put it aside and I thought, okay, you know, I'll take care of it later on. I got to make sure I remember. So somewhere in the midst of all of that, I, in my mind, had taken care of registration because I paid for it, but I forgot about the ticket, which is not good. And so two months later, I'm driving down the same road, going to the same place to grab a sandwich. And wouldn't you know, my friend pulls up behind me again. He pulls me over only this time he called a buddy of his. And so there was another car there and another buddy of his. And there's three cars lined up behind my car off the side of the road. The guy comes up and he says, sir, I need you to step out of the car. There's a warrant for your arrest. I'm like, I, I'm a rule follower, okay? So like, I, I, I don't speak, I'm a rule follower. That's just part of who I am. He says, there's a warrant for your arrest. I thought it was a joke. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he says, no, I, I need you to step out of the car. You're driving on a suspended license. I was like, there's no way. And he said, listen, you, know, you must not have paid a ticket and your license is suspended. I need to impound your car. I need to, you know, we're gonna tow it away. I need to take you to the station. And there's a, there's a warrant out for you. And I was like, this is insane. And so I'm standing there with a spectacle on the road in Pompton Plains. People are driving by, oh, it's Steve. Oh, hi, hey, yeah, it's me. You know, like it's, I'm, and, and in that moment, I'm standing there like everything's, I'm, this is crazy. <laughs> and I'm standing there and I, something in me snapped. And I, I, I need to confess this to you. So I'm standing there with him. And at one point while we're waiting for my car, my car to be towed, I, uh, I, t I turned to the, the officer and I said, uh, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, when you were a little boy dreaming about being a police officer, were you dreaming about moments like this where you could get the riffraff off the street? Like, did you, like, you, you should be proud. Do you lay your head down at night knowing that you have made this town so much safer because you put the pastor from down the street behind bar? You, this should, you, you deserve a pat on the back, sir. Something in me snapped. If you ever wonder if that's a good thing to say to a police officer, it's not. <laughs> don't, don't try it. It's awful. But it was, everything seemed out of control and I was certainly not in control. And, you know, so the guy, he, you know, he put me in the car, he took me to the station, they gave me a mug shot, they took my fingerprints. I later on was told they didn't have to do that, but they were just kind of jabbing me with it, which I deserved, it's fine, I totally deserve that. And that was a bad moment for me. Even worse was the moment I had to call Dave Gustafson, the senior pastor, and say, can you pick me up? And he's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm in jail. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about this. These moments where these things get 
just, it seems unjust. It seems out of control. And I'm amazed at the picture that we have of Jesus in this moment. He is, this is the most unjust thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. There's nothing more unjust than what they're about to do to Jesus. He didn't deserve one bit of it. And yet he is completely in control. And I started thinking like, how, how is Jesus in control? And what is it that led to him being in control in this awful moment where it seems like everything is spinning? And I'm fascinated by John's telling of this gospel because we just spent five chapters on one meeting and yet we get to the arrest of Jesus. He cuts right to the arrest in the garden. But what we miss in John's telling is what we're told in the other gospels about what happened right before. Because if you remember what happens to Jesus in the garden is he slips away on his own. He tells the disciples to remain awake and stay alert. And Jesus goes and he talks to the father. And when he's talking to the father, this is the most agonizing moment in Jesus's life. He knows what's before him. And he cries out to the father and he says, father, if there is any way for this cup to pass from me, if there is any way for salvation to come to these people other than pouring out your wrath on me for their sin. If there's any other way to do this, can you please let me know? It says he was so agonized that his sweat was like drops of blood. He was bleeding sweat out of his body. And he gets to the end of that conversation with his father and he comes to the resolution where he says, father, ultimately not my will, but yours be done. And he makes the decision that it is going to be his will to do the will of the father. And I think about how Jesus can possibly be in control in this moment, but the resolute savior spent his time with God the father and said, I am committed to completing and fulfilling this work. It is your will. This is what I'm here for. And Jesus completely in control in this moment wasn't hiding. You know, it, he could have gone anywhere, right? He went to where Judas knew he would be. He's not, he's not trying to run from them, but he steps forward in the place where he knows he can fulfill the will of God, the will of the Father. And he makes a decision completely in control to do that. Look at what it says in verse four. It says, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, that's what, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, who do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas who betrayed him was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. We see this moment where, where Jesus knowing all the, Jesus knows the prophecies. Jesus knows what he's about to face. He knows in Isaiah 53 that as the suffering servant, he's going to be beaten beyond the point of being able to recognize him as a human being. He knows he's gonna be pierced for our transgressions. He knows he's gonna be raised up. He knows he's going to take the cup of wrath for our sin, knowing all that would happen to him. Jesus came forward and he said to them, who do you seek? And they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus responds by saying, in the ESV translation, it says, I am he. The real words he uses are the same words that God used to identify himself to Moses in the burning bush. The same words that Jesus used when he said earlier in John, he says, before Abraham, ego emi, I am. Jesus says, I am. The words identifying himself with God and as he does, when he utters those words, it says that all of the soldiers fell back and fell to the ground. A tiny little glimpse of the glory and the power of Jesus in that moment. And look, if Jesus wanted a fight, he could have had a fight, right? I mean, he literally uttered two words and all of them fell down. One V 1000, Jesus was going to win that, but Jesus didn't come for a fight. He came to fulfill the will of the father. And if he, he could have slipped out, you know, Jesus did that many times in his ministry where they were coming for him and he slipped out supernaturally. He just kind of disappeared. But what would have happened if Jesus did? They would have arrested his disciples. His disciples would have been in danger. Jesus steps forward and he says, ego emi, I am. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you, 
And I'm sure they're all like cringing. He's gonna say it again. I told you, I am. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those who you gave me. I have not lost one. You can see Jesus' heart for his disciples, right? That he cares for them. In this moment where they're coming for him, he says, listen, I'm the one you seek. Let these disciples go. They're not the ones you're here for. I've cared for you. He says, listen, I, I'm, it's fulfilling the, the prayer that he spoke last week where he says, I have not let one of them go that you've given me. He cares for you. If you are his, you're in his care. You're in the best care you could possibly be in. You're in the best hands. It's not Jake from Allstate. It's Jesus from Nazareth. He says, listen, you came for me. I am here. I'm not gonna lose one of these. But just like us in moments where it seems like it's out of control and just like, you know, we can try to take things into our own hands. Good old Peter. We know Peter. He wants to take some things into his own hands. Look at what happens. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me? Even when Jesus is stepping forward and uttering words and it's like Hadouken and they all fall over. Even when he's showing his power, Peter's somehow like, I got this, Jesus. He reaches in and he takes out his sword and he must have been standing behind Malchus. Malchus was one of the servants of Caiaphas, the high priest. He must have been standing behind him and he took a swipe. I love how Ryan talks about it. He's like, this is the most unathletic move ever. He must have been like, I'm gonna get you. And just like, was he even looking? And it says that he cuts off Malchus's right ear. Which now what? Because Peter has taken control into his own hands, taken things into his own hands, now Peter is in danger. Because what's gonna happen if you strike one of these people who are servants of the high priest Caiaphas? Now you're going to be arrested or hurt or maybe even killed. We see in the book of Luke that Jesus, in great care of Peter, he reaches over and he takes the ear that's flopped there on the ground. And he picks it up and he puts it to Malchus's head and he heals Malchus. Even when we take things into our own hands and try to use our power, and many times it ends in creating more damage than would have been done otherwise, right? But even in that, Jesus cares for him. Jesus cares for Peter in that moment where he just makes an awful decision. And Peter would have been in danger, but Jesus is caring for him, things seem to be out of control. And rather than trusting Jesus, he tried to take it in his own hands and Jesus corrects him and he says, shall I not take this cup that the father has given me? Shall I not drink? The, the cup he's speaking of is the wrath of God. The cup of wrath that Jesus knows that he has to drink on the cross. The cup of wrath that every single one of us have contributed to in that cup. And Jesus, the resolute Savior says, I am here to fulfill the will of my father to take this cup that he's given me. And he gives himself over to the mob. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him as if that could really hold the Lord of glory. First, they led him to Annas for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. We're about to see, you know, these events unfold really quickly through this passage and next week as well. But they take him to the house of Annas. Now, Annas was the power behind the power. He was the one that was high priest, but he was the one that made Caiaphas high priest. So they realize if we can go to Annas and we can get him to agree to kill Jesus, that this is, everything else will be a formality. Annas was known as a, as just a evil ruler. And they wanted to convince him that it was time to take Jesus's life. They knew it was easy to convince Caiaphas because he had already declared back in John chapter 11, he said, it would be better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. What was he saying? He's saying it's better for us to kill Jesus than lose this whole nation, to lose all of what we have, to lose all of our power. So why don't, we, why don't we kill Jesus and take care of the situation? They knew Caiaphas was convinced. I think it's in here because they're really just, God is trying to let us know this is not going to be a fair trial. This is going to be a, a clear cut, awful, unjust ruling that Jesus was about to face. And Jesus goes to Annas 
And meanwhile, after the mob has brought Jesus to Annas' house, they're all following behind, and we see a glimpse of, of who else is following behind. It says this, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So Peter and this other disciple follow this group to the house of Annas where Jesus is being taken. And it says that the other disciple, and most scholars believe that the other disciple is actually John himself. He didn't want to write his name in there. But it makes sense because his family knew the high priest's family. And so John follows along. He goes into the courtyard. He's able to go into the residence where, where Annas lived. But Peter wasn't. And he was standing outside at the gate. And so John went over to the servant girl who was manning the gate and said, hey, can you let this guy in? And this is what happens. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So Peter's at the gate, John goes over, says, hey, would you allow this man in? It's interesting what the servant girl says. She turns to Peter and says, you are also not one of his disciples, meaning that she, she knew that John was a disciple of Jesus, that this was known to her. So she asked Peter straight out, are you also one of Jesus's disciples? And you remember what Jesus said to John earlier when, or uh, said to Peter earlier when Peter was with him and he said, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you. I'll never allow this to happen to you. I, I will stand by you. And Jesus turns to him and says, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And we see this first denial at the gate of Annas' house. And this was an easy one, right? Like, you know, the the girl asks him, like, are you also one of, one of his followers? He could have ignored her question and came in. He could have, you know, just kind of mumbled something as he went by. But she asks him directly, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And Peter says, I am not a follower of Christ. We see this first denial. All of these, this scene is amazing because these things are happening simultaneously. So we're seeing these, these different moments going on, but Jesus is in with Annas while Peter and John are outside and coming in the gate. This is all happening at the same time. And this is what struck me this week. While Jesus is inside giving his life, taking the steps to fulfill the will of the Father, while he is inside loving them and serving them, at the very same moment, Peter is outside denying him. At the very same moment, this is all happening. And this is the love of Christ. This is the love of Christ for us. That at the very same moment, while we are in our brokenness and in our mess and trying to take control for ourselves and trying to use our own strength and fight our own battles, but we're in moments where maybe we feel ashamed or we're struggling with being confident in Christ. At that very same moment, Jesus is laying down his life for you because he loves you. The love of our completely in control, sacrificing, loving Savior Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you're like the, the rulers of Israel. You know, maybe you, you've encountered Christ. You're here today because you know, you're, you're taking a step to even be here tonight because you're interested in who Jesus is. But maybe in your own life, you've encountered Christ and maybe you're fearful, just like the rulers of Israel. Maybe you've wrestled with the idea that if this guy really is who he says he is, if he is the I am, if he is the one that is deserving of my whole life, if he made me, if he made me to know him, if this really is about knowing God and making him known, that if I give myself over to him, if I allow him to have that kind of rule and reign over my kingdom, that it means I'm gonna have to, I, I stand to lose. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe you're afraid to lose the things that you love that maybe you know you shouldn't love. Afraid to lose the things that are sinful in your life that you know you have no business doing and yet Jesus calls you to give your life fully to him. 
And you could do what the, the leaders of Israel try to do. You could, you've, you've silenced him. You, when you've heard those voices, when you've heard God prompt your spirit that this thing isn't right and you need to be freed from it, you've silenced that. You've pushed away the savior. Maybe you've tried to silence him for good. Like the leaders of Israel are trying to do. And you can try to silence him and you can try and kill him off in your own heart. But here's the truth. Jesus doesn't stay dead. He keeps coming back. You can't silence Jesus. And maybe it's time to really consider who he is. And if he is who he says he is, then that means he, he demands your soul. He demands your life. Maybe it's time you finally stop trying to silence him and you listen to him and you listen to him pleading for you even when you're out in the courtyard denying him. And maybe you think I'm not good enough. He would never want me. But you don't have to look far to see that he does. Look at Peter. The denying mess of a guy trying to take control for himself who walked with Jesus every day. And yet even in that mess, Jesus is still inside laying down his life for you. At the very same moment where you're struggling with the things you're struggling with, Jesus is laying down his life for you. You know, I don't, I don't think he'd want me. I don't think I'm good enough. Jesus did not come to save the people who are good because the reality is none of us are good. I love what Romans 5 says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you are still in your sin, Christ dies for you. While you're still in the courtyard denying him, Christ is giving his life for you. Will you see that savior and give your life to him? Will you accept the gift of forgiveness he offers you? He will drink down the wrath of all that you deserve. That's what he was resolute to do. It's the decision he made in full control. He did that for you. And if you already have made the decision to give your life to him, like many of us who are here, the reality is in, in those moments where things feel like they are completely out of control, where everything's going wrong, where things are spiraling, where you feel helpless, can you trust the one who you can always know is fully in control? Can you trust the one who has always shown that he's trustworthy? Rather than trying to take control into your hands, and use your strength to solve your battles, can you trust the one who has already gone before you and fought this battle, the ultimate battle, and has come out victorious? Can you walk in the peace that comes from walking with that God who is fully in control and fully loving of you, even in those struggles? My hope and prayer all week has just been that we would see this reality of our own brokenness, even as Jesus dies for us, and walk in the tension of that, but be able to trust in that savior who knowing our denials, knowing our struggles, knowing our fights that we've taken on ourselves, that he still gives his life for you. I pray that we would. Would you guys join me in that prayer? Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that we see in it. Thank you for the reality of your love for us, knowing all that you were going to face, knowing all that that you would face because of us. That God, you laid down your life and chose with resolution to fulfill the will of the Father. God, in moments, and I know right now in this room, there are people who are in situations where they feel like things are completely out of control and that maybe evil is, looks like it's winning in your life or that things aren't going right. God, I trust that in those things, for us that know you, that we would choose to relinquish our own control and give it all over to you, the one who even in the worst and most unjust and most awful of situations was fully in control and still is ruling and reigning. God, for those that are here today and don't know you, maybe they've tried to silence you. 
Maybe they're afraid. God, I pray that they would take the step of receiving your gift of forgiveness, your gift of being reconciled. If they've even created pain and hurt from the way that they've lived, God, to see your love, that you will even take the wounds that we've made from the way we've responded and you will even heal those. We're all in need of much healing, Lord, but we've come to the healer. And I pray, God, that you would just reveal your power in ways tonight, whether it's bringing someone to life to stop running and silencing you for the first time or whether it's in those that need to know that you are the one in control. Thank you for the truth of your word and your promises, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and respond.
And that's the awesome truth that we get to walk with that, look, we've been pretty clear, like <laughs> we're a bunch of messes. <laughs> we've made our mistakes, you know, like every one of us. And yet the work that he starts in you by giving your life to him, Peter, total mess. And yet weeks after this is gonna stand up in front of thousands of people and proclaim the gospel and the church will be born. We're here today because God used a total mess to continue to carry the truth of how he heals and restores and offers life. Lord, I pray that as people who can be honest about who we are, as people who are desperately in need of your healing and restoration in all that we are, God, that we would take you at your word and that we would believe that this work that you've begun in us, that you're still working out in us, that God, you were working on our behalf while we're denying you and you are still working on our behalf as you continue to recreate us. Thank you, Lord, for that awesome promise. You are good on your promise. So Lord, I pray that we'd walk in that reality, have grace with others because we need your grace, but also walk in the light of the love of our great Savior who goes for us, who took the cup for us. May we respond with our whole lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Great worship with you all tonight. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.